In the summer of 2021-22, I noticed weather reporters pointing to the top of Western Australia and calling it the heat engine of the country. I'd never heard about the heat engine, so I read about it, and it turns out meteorologists agree that virtually all extreme heat events in Australia begin there. How many Australians know that? If this heat engine has such a big impact, why is no one talking about it? Why aren't we trying to cool it down? Our host, Laura Wells, set out to learn if that's even possible. I am going to speak to all sorts of people and ask all sorts of questions, step by step, as we search for a solution. Okay, let's start by looking closely at the problem. Where exactly in Australia is the heat engine? And how much can it really even affect the country? Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, Sarah, nice to meet you. Sarah, I want to talk about the heat engine of Australia. Is yeah. there such a thing? In parts of Western Australia, sometimes up north, sometimes more centrally in Western Australia, when there's no cloud, um, effectively the sun can come in, it can hit a very dry location and it gets really hot really quickly. And it's that build up of heat that then gets swept across the rest of Australia that explains a lot of the hot weather that we tend to see, that really intense hot weather. That heat, does that sweep across from west to east and that's what we feel here on the east coast? Yeah, what can happen, sometimes the heat can just sit there and Western Australia can bake under those conditions. Or we do have a situation that we cannot control where the weather moves from west to east and that's something, you know, as it, as it comes over the west, it dries out. What if there was more cloud cover in that region? Yes, but how to make that happen? There are things that are very big and, and very difficult to control. Yeah, it'd be a huge, a huge scale experiment. Oh, 110%, yeah. <laughs> Do you think it would be achievable? May I be honest? I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> okay. um, all right, so is anyone doing anything about it, scientists, governments? We need all brains on deck to sort this, but I don't, I don't think we're in a position that we can control the heat engine as such. It's how we cope with that heat is going to be more of the issue moving forward. How much hotter do you think it could get in the next few summers? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> uh, it depends. I mean, places in Sydney could see temperatures very close to or over 50 degrees Celsius. Do you think we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions fast enough to actually stop temperature rising? Look, it's really imperative, and I can't stress this enough, that we do need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But the problem is there's already so much carbon into the atmosphere, and that will, can hang around for at least a couple of hundred years. Well, so even if we stopped emitting all carbon emissions today, it's still going to go up. How worried are you on a scale of one to 10? A hard 10. I'm really worried. I, climate change is this huge beast that we understand, but we've got no idea on how to tame or we're not taming it fast enough. We need to do so much more. After the Black Summer bushfires, a Royal Commission was held and they said, in quotes, making the nation more resilient to natural disasters calls for strategic imagination and yeah. big country thinking. So do we need big country thinking to really cool down this heat engine? Yes, but I don't think we can cool down the engine as such. It's how we adapt to what it's doing. That's the prevailing opinion. We have to learn to live with the heat, except that all the most interesting ideas run counter to what we think we know, don't they? For example, would it surprise you to know that all of Australia was much, much greener and wetter just five or 6,000 years ago? Mary E. White was Australia's preeminent paleobotanist, and she wrote about the greenhouse period 30 years ago. It's high time we revisited her work. Crocodile and hippo bones found in the Sahara Desert have been carbon dated back to 7,000 years old. It's no secret, you may already know that. For several thousand years, the desert was covered in savanna grasslands and trees, while wet season rains filled the rivers and the lakes. What you might not know is that at the very same time, Australia's great sandy desert was covered in woodland and rivers ran all year round. Turn to page 178 if you're reading along at home. So what was going on? 20,000 years ago, at the end of the last glacial maximum, ice sheets up to three kilometres thick covered the top of the world. 
Antarctica was roughly twice as big as it is now, and Australia was a single landmass from the bottom of Tasmania to the top of New Guinea. A colder, drier place with about half as much rain as we get now. And like a spinning top, every so often the Earth wobbles slightly on its axis. This happens in predictable cycles over tens of thousands of years. 20,000 years ago, the world wobbled on its axis and the northern ice sheets turned more towards the sun and they started to melt. Temperatures went up and down over thousands of years. Then, 11,700 years ago, the Holocene Epoch began. Global temperatures jumped four or five degrees Celsius. Sea levels rapidly rose, cutting Tasmania and New Guinea off from mainland Australia. Why did it change so quickly? There was so much melting ice water pouring into the oceans that currents were completely disrupted. Carbon was churned up from the ocean floor and also released from beneath the ice. Atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane levels shot up. As the air warmed, it held more water vapour, which accelerated the temperature rise. A greenhouse period began, which lasted 5,000 years. Remember that most of North America, Scandinavia and Russia had been buried under ice for millennia. Nothing grew there. The vast boreal forests that cover the top of the world now were created out of thin air, using sunlight, water and atmospheric CO2. There was enough rain and enough CO2 during the greenhouse period to make the whole world wetter and greener, even the Sahara Desert. After the harshness of life during the Ice Age, Earth was a paradise for all humans and all living creatures. It was Eden for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Even with all of those trees growing all over the world, it still took 5,000 years for the CO2 levels to drop far enough for the greenhouse period to end, and the world gradually became cooler and drier again. Another ice age was due to end the warm, stable climate we've enjoyed for 10,000 years. Instead, human activity has now created the conditions for a new greenhouse period. Except, it's now hotter than any time during the last greenhouse period, and getting hotter. There's more atmospheric CO2 than any time in several million years, and it's still going up. We have two choices. We can either leave the heat engine as it is to get hotter as the summers get hotter, or we try to help nature to make the Northwest and the whole of the country wetter and greener like it was for thousands of years, just five or 6,000 years ago. There are Australian farmers already working to help make that happen. Our plan is to meet with farmer and wetland regeneration advocate Martin Royds. He practices a system called natural sequence farming, pioneered by a grazier called Peter Andrews. We must establish water bodies when it rains, then we must put plants in to stop that water evaporating, leaching or whatever else. Life starts by water bodies and then the plants gradually spread away. That means that as they spread away, they actually manage the water. It's fundamental to everything that happens in the environment. Peter is an expert in how the Australian landscape works and Martin has put into place Peter's principles right here on this farm. So let's go check it out. Hi Martin, nice to meet you. Nice pond. Thank you. It's a lot easier to work with nature than against it. Martin, what did this farm look like when you took it over? Well, the early settlers drained the swamps and they put a little drain in and then that took off. And by the time I got here, the drains were erosion gullies four metres deep. So that was facilitating all of that water rushing out to sea? Absolutely. In a rain event, all the fertility got washed into that erosion gully and out within hours. Uh, now the system we've got set up here, it can take years for the same water to go down through the system. So Martin, does it make a huge difference now that there's all this water here where there used to be a dry gully? Oh, massive. In the last drought, I could feed all my cattle here and there was 20,000 litres of water a day flowing out into the Shoalhaven River. That's a huge amount. Was that before the black summer bushfires? That was just before the, the Shoalhaven had stopped flowing and we still had water here so we could supply the helicopters with water. 
Now, Martin, I saw that there were a couple of drainage ditches that looks like you've cut that are full of water. Isn't that just doing the same old problem, creating more erosion? If they were running downhill, yes, but they're not ditches. They're actually contour drains. So what are they actually for then? To take the water from the valleys further out onto the landscape and then to hydrate the whole landscape. And that's how you get this beautiful, lush landscape. So yes, we've got green grass down here and we've got cuttings along the tops of the hills and they're on the contour and they capture the water from the top and there's steps coming down and they're spreading the water out, hydrating the whole landscape. This is a long way from the north of Western Australia. And nowhere near as hot and dry. But do you think something like this could work over there where that land is really hard baked? Peter Andrews says that the laws of nature are the same everywhere. So as long as you can got water and sunlight and plants, you can do it. There are billions of plants already growing across the heat engine. It's not all sandy desert, but a lot is dry scrub. Where they get some water, the trees grow bigger. Is there enough water over in Western Australia? Oh, there's some huge river systems up there and they get to dump in the wet season. But it all just flows out to sea? That's what we've got to do, slow the flow. Watch the next episode. We'll take a look at Rajasthan in India, where the climate and conditions are very similar to the north of Western Australia, and where dry, dead rivers have been brought to life year round by capturing the wet season rainfall. And we'll also consider a simple solution that could change the way we manage our catchment dams all across the country. Tree.